So if you saw my last video in November, you'll know that I was talking about the overhaul of my website. And one of the things I talked about is how I had made a gallery page for a lot of the photos I had more recently taken, as well as some other ones I'd taken previously, like last year and so on. And I was really excited about that part of my website as it showcased some of my newer work. And I was talking about the nature photos mostly because that's what most of the photos were. I'd been out a lot in the Toronto area taking photos of wildlife, specifically birds mostly, as well as some plants. And I wanted to do this video today because I'm really excited about sharing the gear I was using for those photos. And I know I talked a little bit about that in my last upload, kind of putting some feelers out there for what people wanted to see. So I'm here today to talk about the gear I've been using to shoot wildlife and um, how you can do the same for actually not that much money. So starting with the camera, the body I'm using is the only body I have and that's what I'm shooting on right now. This is the Canon 80D. It's not amazing. It's not the newest body from Canon and it is using their old EF lens mount. So, you know, it's not cutting edge, but what I do love about it is that when it comes to photos, it's actually a very strong camera. I do often talk about the video limitations of my camera here on the channel because I am a video person mainly. That's what I did for a very long time, just exclusively. So, you know, 1080p at 30 or 60 FPS, like that's the max the camera can do. So I'm always talking about that thing. But when it comes to photos, this camera can shoot straight out of camera, because Canon's colors are awesome. Very, very nice looking, uh, 6,000 by 4,000 raw photos, which is amazing. So paired with all that power, I have this lens. This has been the go-to, and this is what 98% of all of my wildlife photos have been taken on. This is the Canon EFS 55 to 250 mil. So this isn't even a high-end lens. This is literally just the most basic zoom lens you can get for Canon EFS cameras. And it's EFS because it only works on the APS-C size sensor like the one found in the Canon 80D over here. And let me tell you, I got this thing used. It's not the most solidly built. You know, you can hear something rattling around in there. But you know, it's worked out well enough for me. And Key fact here, you might think 55 to 250, like that's a really weird range, but let me tell you something. Because of the APS-C size sensor, it is effectively in 85 to 400 mil, which starts to make a lot more sense in the context of wildlife photography. So I'm gonna show some photos on screen now of what kind of things I've shot with this lens. And these are gonna be the photos that have come straight out of camera. And these look, a lot of them, pretty awesome. And the thing is when you're shooting wildlife, a lot of the times you cannot get close, which is particularly true with a lot of the photos I was shooting, because you've got fish, like you can't get into the water. You've got birds, they're way high up in the tree. And if you get much closer, they'll be scared away. And, or you've got like really small subjects like this caterpillar and this spider. And this is where kind of the weaknesses of this lens start to appear because the focusing is not amazing. Um, I will talk a little bit more about the settings I'm using when I'm shooting just in a second. But with this lens, the focus plane is a little finicky and the minimum focus distance is not that good. But as long as you're shooting a decently sized subject, like decently far away from you, with the 400 mil range you get on this, it's actually not that bad. Now paired with this lens, there are certain settings I use to kind of make it optimal for shooting wildlife. So obviously I'm turning on burst mode and that's just, you know, the most basic thing to do when you're shooting a moving subject. It can create a ton of files on your card, but I've got a 64 gig card and I've, if I'm just snapping photos all day, there's no way I'm gonna be filling that up. So I definitely go for the continuous shooting modes. And then of course I'm shooting raw, of course I'm shooting raw. But then 
slightly controversial from me, and I know this may not impress the photography snobs out there or the you know professional photographers out there, but a lot of the time I am shooting in auto mode for the following reasons. One, I'm not that fast at changing settings and I haven't done enough photography at this point to really understand like what ISO, what shutter speed, like just nail everything based on the environment I'm in, in the moment. And with moving subjects, that's really hard to do. Let me tell you, I've done a, just, just a little bit of like landscape photography. With that, buildings and mountains aren't gonna move. So I am totally fine to be in manual, dial in the settings ideally, and just shoot it. But the thing is, with auto mode, I can get close enough and even if it misses a little bit, reason number two is I'm shooting in raw. So even if it's overexposed or something like is not right about the photo, then guess what? I can fix it in post because with raw photos, there's so much more metadata to work with. Now there is one really specific situation where I will not shoot in auto. When I am shooting in really dense environments like trees, like if I'm trying to get a bird that's in a tree, and the autofocus is not picking the right spot to focus on, like where the animal is, I will have my auto, like I'll get the auto mode to dial in the settings, ISO, shutter speed, etc., And then I will switch to manual so I can pick the autofocus point manually. Or on another note, if there is a really fast moving subject, like the salmon that are on screen now, then I will go into manual mode as well. Since I'm just shooting one thing in a certain plane, I can dial in the settings and I need to have a really fast shutter speed and auto mode doesn't know that. So I will go into manual for really fast moving subjects so I can get that shutter speed really fast. So when I take the photo, it's frozen in time, nothing's blurry, nothing's moving, and I get a really clean photo as a result. Now something else I do have in my camera bag when I'm out shooting wildlife is the Nifty 50. That's the Canon EF 50mm 1.8 lens. So F1.8, obviously an amazing, an amazing aperture to get that nice blurred background. Now, I love this lens. I use this a lot for portraits. This is my portrait lens, it's awesome. But what I will say is that for wildlife, there are a few drawbacks. One, F1.8, having such a shallow aperture means it's really hard to nail focus, especially on moving subjects. Also, being a prime lens, you have to move your feet instead of moving your hands on the lens barrel. So it's really tricky to get the right framing uh, for your subject. Now, other than that, this is a great wildlife photography lens, but it's better in kind of like predictable settings like a zoo, where you know you're gonna be a certain distance away from the animals at all times. So I haven't found myself using this that much out in the wild, but of course I do have other uses for this lens, so I'm definitely getting my money's worth. And the great thing about both of these lenses is they're not that expensive. The Nifty 50 brand new is like 150 bucks, and it may be less now that Canon is more focused on the RF versions of this lens. This is the EF version. This lens, as I mentioned, I got used for like $200, actually a little less and it hasn't, it's very lightly used, mind you, but honestly, for what it is, it's not a bad deal. Like, you're getting an 85 to 400, approximately, 85 to 400 mil zoom lens, and it works really well. Now, I understand that it's an EFS lens, so it'll only ever work on APS-C size cameras with their sensor sizes, but for what it is, it's a really nice lens and I'm not, I'm not a pixel peeper. Like I'm not checking for maximum sharpness, maximum detail, but like you can see in some of the photos, there is a ton of detail there. And I, I give a lot of credit to the camera body and the sensor for being able to capture a lot of that. But that's what it really comes down to. You want to have a nice zoom range that works for you and the wildlife environment you're in. You want it to have you know, a decent aperture so you can still get some depth of field, whether that's fixed or variable is up to you. And then also you want it to have nice autofocus, ideally very fast, especially if you're doing continuous shooting. And that's really what it comes down to. Wildlife photography, there are, 
there is such a range of work out there. Like if you just look through National Geographic, you will just be amazed. Like watch any nature documentary. Like it'll just blow your mind. But the good news is it's really easy to get started and you can just pick up a used lens, throw it on the body you likely already have as long as it can shoot raw photos and you're ready to rock. That's really all there is to it. And the barrier to entry is so low. Just walk outside wherever you are. You'll find something that moves to shoot. It doesn't even have to be an animal. Plants are really good to practice on because they don't move as much. You can practice shooting in manual, start using manual focus, and really work on your skills as a wildlife photographer. And that's what I really wanted to stress in this video. The barrier to entry is lower than ever, and you don't have to have fancy gear to get some really great photos. And I hope you have learned that by watching this video. If you wanna see more of my photography work, definitely head over to my website, kylenewcomb.com. And while you're there, you can also check out some of the other things I'm doing, including this YouTube channel. And if you want more tech videos like this on YouTube, definitely subscribe and leave a like on this video. And I will see you in the new year for some more uploads.